So wonderful. Great. I welcome you very warmly to the second panel, which is supposed to discuss the future, the challenges ahead, um, uh, what we should look like in five years. And um, I mean, as you all know, the first years of the SSM was very much about setting up the organization, um, establishing the relationship with the NCAs, um, establishing supervisory approaches for the most relevant uh, topics. It was about some crisis cases uh, we had to work uh, with too. And now, um, I mean, after five years, um, the question is, what do we see on the horizon? What kind of challenges uh, do we see? What should we look like in five years? Uh, where should we move towards? Yeah, um, I think before we go into medias res, I would like to introduce very quickly, you know, not the whole CV because you know everybody here on the stage, yeah? but I would like to um, stress or point out um, some specificities of the panelists here. And I think we have a wonderful set of panelists uh, here from um, yeah, different perspectives uh, bringing uh, together um, uh, to, to get the best view of, of the next five years. We have with Sven Giegold, uh, MEP and co-rapporteur um, for the SSM regulation, if I re remember correctly. And we have with Sir Jonathan Fall, um, to in German translated into English, you would call it the birth father yeah? um, of the SSM. They had, a f uh, well, quite a fair uh, a share of, of work with us and um, they had their own perspectives of what we are supposed to do, I'm pretty sure, 2012-13 um, uh, uh, when the regulation was discussed. We have with my good friend Jonathan Fichter uh, somebody who will bring the view, the perspective from the outside on the SSM and with his vast experience in uh, the, some supervisory authorities in the US, <laughs> if I remember correctly, OCC, and the IMF FDIC. and the World Bank, etc. And you were... FDIC. You, FDIC, and if I remember correctly... thrift supervisor. Yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, many, many, many experiences, yeah. We will have the outside view, yeah. And then with Elke König, we have a former supervisory board member, so you will have... Um, and you still have the, the deepest insight because you are participating in our supervisory board uh, meetings um, um, on several topics uh, regularly. Um, and we have with her as the chair um, of the SRB, one of the important stakeholders um, um, of the SSM. So a very distinguished uh, group here. And I hope for a very lively debate. Um, and um, the first question, the kickoff questions I would like to ask is, um, well, we want to ensure the success of the SSM in the next years too. So what do you think we need to do in order to ensure the success? What should the next five years look like? Um, do you see anything on the horizon what is necessary to do with regard to the institutional setup? Yeah. Um, what would you tell us with regard to what should we encourage the banks to do? Yeah, going a little bit more perhaps into the supervision. The last panel did a little bit of future already, yeah, but that was very much focused on the regulatory part. So this would be my first question. And I would start with Sven, if you do not mind, because I know him to be a very critical um, uh, brain. Yeah, and um, I just hope that we will get some, um, uh, some lively discussion about it. I hope you don't mind me saying this. Oh, you can. <laughs> uh, we are German and don't have exactly. to be nice. That's not our role. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, we, anyway, um, we get on anyway and stick together. Uh, it, it's, um, well, uh, first of all, it's a bit ironic to ask that question about uh, the institutional setup after yesterday night. Uh, because uh, not last night, not the one, but uh, the one before, is rather Monday night, is rather symbolic. Because I would say there was a lot of ambition to change things, also institutionally. And, uh, and the result uh, was, uh, was rather insulting uh, for the country which tried to bring that change. And, 
and the best banking supervision cannot succeed if there's not a sound, a, a sound macroeconomic environment and sound institutions for the common currency. So, uh, and that is uh, what shows so clearly the, the limits. Uh, and, um, and equally, we all have lots of dreams what we could do if we had a treaty change. But uh, I don't see any treaty change in the foreseeable future. So some of the key limits which the SSM uh, had uh, are treaty-based limits. So uh, it's not very logical to be responsible for cross-border banking, but not for supervision. It is not very logical to have the responsibility for the banks, but not equally uh, for other business models, which are not formally banks, uh, but take similar risks and compete in, in similar markets. Uh, and this is uh, difficult to overcome in the framework of the existing treaties. And, uh, and therefore, we have um, restrictions which we cannot easily overcome. Uh, therefore, one wish uh, uh, to the ECB as a whole, but to SSM as well, is to not to disengage from these debates, but uh, to play an active role. And I can only say that uh, despite of what has been said uh, very often in Germany about the ECB, uh, it was very much the ECB and Mario who went regularly uh, to the meetings of the Council and insisted uh, on much more common uh, economic uh, and financial policy in Europe. And uh, equally, uh, I have seen very often in the European Parliament that opinions by the ECB and also uh, opinions of the SSM were extremely helpful to break uh, certain lobby-driven or national-driven special interest opinions. So therefore, I can only say uh, also in the future, the SSM should, and the ECB should play an active role in promoting, um, in promoting um, policy responses and regulatory responses, which are in the common European interest. And uh, in order to have a counterweight uh, to um, too much nationally driven exemptions. So also yesterday, we had the CRD-CRR uh, deal. And now you can see a total change. Uh, there's lots of good things in the new rules. But you can also see lots of special interests. And la unlike last time, Sylvie, uh, last time it was that the special interests mainly came from the council. It is sad to say that this time a lot of special interests also came from the parliament. And uh, they not only came from the groups of the centre-right, they also came from the centre-left. And that is uh, something which I see with great concern, so you can now count software investment as capital. Come on. Uh, is this serious? Uh, so, uh, and I can give you more examples, but I will not bore you. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, therefore, I think the main wish I would have is prepare that the institutional setup will not change uh, in, under these circumstances <coughs> dramatically. Use the space you got, be creative in using it, and do not always say, uh, this was not our key mandate, because in the end, um, Financial stability uh, also depends, for instance, on the absence of financial criminality. Look at the large German institution. Uh, so there is no such limit to say uh, we have no mandate for financial criminality, uh, but then suddenly you have solvency issues triggered by exactly that criminality. So therefore, Take the mandate of, uh, of financial pr prudence seriously and, uh, and interpret it in a way which, uh, which is uh, robust and not in an in a over narrow way, even if not everybody in Europe will be happy about that. So uh, this is, uh, I don't know whether this was provocative enough, but, uh, uh, Absolutely. but I would don't say worry. that is what I mean. <laughs> Don't worry, Sven. I, I, I knew for sure that you would deliver. Um, but let me, <laughs> let me go to, to Sir Johnson. I mean, Sven tells us we are supposed to be bold and brave. And in particular, not only with regard to the task we got via the lawmaker, but 
um, at the <coughs> margins um, of the task or the indirect ones or perhaps even not the task we did not get, yeah? Um, AML, for example. Um, <laughs> Do you think that the political climate right now is uh, one which, which um, promotes or fosters um, uh, supervisors which are tough, which use their discretion, which try to set uh, policies uh, for um, banks, uh, ensuring um, equal treatment, uh, etc., which, uh, which try to, to set expectations? Do you see a change there? I mean, looking ahead, what would you think um, we will get as, a, as an answer? Uh, frankly, no, I don't, uh, or at least not enough. Uh, we have to learn how to progress without a crisis, hoping that there isn't one. We make progress in after a crisis, and we do a lot, and then we get tired and we get complacent. Uh, and we want to move on, not we in this community, but uh, the political world in general. That is happening all over the world. Uh, and what we have to do in Europe, because the stakes are very high for us, is, I'll come to my own country in a minute, uh, I know that uh, I'm the token Brit up here, uh, but uh, we Europeans, I can still say that, uh, and I will continue to say that, by the way, Uh, we Europeans have to find a way to substitute for crisis as a driver of uh, regulatory progress. And the only answer is, it's very easy to say, political leadership. Uh, political leadership in the European institutions in their broadest sense and in the member states. Are we doing very well at that at the moment? Obviously not. Uh, is 2019 a big year? It certainly is. There will be a new leadership, uh, new leaderships uh, at various levels in all the European institutions, and we will finally find out what sort of Brexit, there you are, here we are, uh, we are having. And it won't be an overnight Uh, sudden understanding of a new relationship, there will be another five years of, I hope, uh, rebuilding a uh, sensible relationship in the continent of Europe with uh, the United Kingdom, which, at least as I see things today, but every hour brings uh, new developments in, in London at the moment, I think Brexit is going to happen uh, on the 29th of March. But I don't know in what circumstances. So we will have to take account of those circumstances uh, in this particular world, for this particular institution, for Andrea uh, in his uh, future role, uh, the building or the maintenance of Andrea is essentially a Londoner these days. Uh, uh, Andrea will uh, have to uh, build and maintain uh, the relationships uh, he uh, and you, uh, Danielle, and others have built up uh, so that we have sound, sensible regulatory and supervisory cooperation between uh, uh, the European Union, between the Euro area and, and the United Kingdom. But again, putting my country to one side for a minute, the obvious tasks are a genuine rule book, a genuine single rule book. We are very far from that. We've made enormous progress frankly, thanks to the crisis and the hard work of several people in this room. But it's not yet single. There are bumps all over the place in the playing field. We know that. Uh, and uh, one has to consolidate what has already been achieved while keeping uh, the focus on what remains uh, to be done. Will we Europeans collectively summon the political will to do it, again, I hope a crisis doesn't occur again to force it. I remember uh, uh, sitting in my uh, office with Ignazio uh, Angeloni and we would say to each other, we, are, we don't have the right toolkit today. We are making sure that our grandchildren <laughs> have the right toolkit when the time comes. Now, since then, I have grandchildren uh, and I, they're not ready to supervise banks yet, uh, but Uh, we were thinking that there wouldn't be a crisis for a very long time. How can we be sanguine about that 
today, given the challenges uh, which we still face. Okay. I'll, I'll leave you at the end, you okay. know, getting the, 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 the outside view. Um, Elke, um, I mean, we, we, we heard now a very clear um, yeah, task uh, coming from Sven and the more political, you know, uh, background and basis uh, from Jonathan. I mean, when you look forward for the next five years, what would you like the SSM to do and what do you think we need as a basis in order to be successful to do this? And that might be even the more difficult question. I was just saying, is that a simple question as a no. start, as a warm-up? But let me do something totally different. I still remember, Danielle, when we were <laughs> sitting in the high-level group that was there to establish the SSM. Compared to the times then, I think you have achieved an enormous task, and we have an SSM. Let's start with that. And I think I never heard such an understatement than the speech of Mario Draghi. If you always add a plus to whatever he said in praise of the SSM and of you, I think you are getting closer to truth. So I think thank you as first and foremost for the cooperation. So where are we? I think we have done quite a lot on getting to a level playing field in supervision. Do we have the real toolkit to get there always there. I would agree with Sven, sometimes you need to be challenging. But what I'm a bit more concerned in looking at what was agreed in recent days, what is the result of the trilogue, we need to be very careful on the political side not to roll back. Because clearly we have now, I'm very much more focusing on our own framework, so BRRD and SRMR. We've achieved a lot also there to strengthen some areas. But we have also introduced the invitation to ring fencing within the banking union. It's called fishing option or the mic. And I think we will be, need to be very carefully monitoring what's happening there. Isn't this more fragmenting? then supporting. If the total number is X, and now you allow everyone to decide the slice of his piece of the pie, you might end for the home country or for the center with a surprisingly small piece where you would like to have a bigger piece. So that's one thing. But to look forward, and you in the, your introduction you said, let's go for the next steps. I think there is clearly ongoing work in the SSM, and I won't interfere, it's your work. But there is also one a part of the work which we are still just have started because the SRB came one year later and is now building up. MREL, minimum requirements for eligible liabilities and own funds, needs to be built up. Some banks are struggling in building up the regulatory capital. Now, for those, it might not be easier that they also have to build up the needed MREL to make themselves resolvable. But if you can't build up the capital, the logical alternative is you shrink into the capital you have. So that we need to consider for banks. And the second one is clearly to address impediments starting from data and going into by far more cumbersome topics. So all in all, to make banks resolvable is something which is clearly on our list, but also on the SSM list. And we have to work together. And we have to make sure that it's not for supervisors and for resolution authorities to make the bank resolvable. It's for the banks to make themselves resolvable for us to push and to guide them. This is the one area where I think we have joint work to be done. The second part is clearly finalizing the reforms. After Monday night, we have a backstop. You should read the term sheet fast, and then you see all the positive parts. If you read fast enough, you don't see what is missing. And the second part, but what's clearly missing still in the, back, in the backstop, is the part on liquidity. We need a solution for funding in resolution. And what I mean now is not how to protract the death of a bank. I mean how to be able to have a convincing short-term funding option after resolution weekend until the market <coughs> kicks in. So we are talking about viable 
and solvent banks. This is an area which is still missing. There are some sentences in, so we have to push hard together. Second part is clearly there has been the idea, and we mentioned FDIC, whether we can take a lot of inspiration from that there was the idea to have three pillars for the banking union. Now the versions you hear are between the third pillar being EDIS, is in coma, it's on life support, or someone said you need to have a fresh start with another name for it. So, but we definitely need an answer, which also goes to what Marie, uh, Jose Maria was talking about. How do you deal with mid-size and smaller banks? Not all banks will fall under a resolution regime. So if a smaller bank has to disappear, you have to have a convincing solution which also goes to you need to have fit for purpose insolvency procedures because that's what it is about. I stop here because I could otherwise go on with a long list of what we have to work together on. Not all for us to be done or for you to be done, but to be achieved together by the industry, by regulators, by legislators. It just needs to be done. Yeah, yeah. So, so it will not be a boring job for no. the next five years, I'm very sure. <laughs> um, Jonathan, you have a very genuine perspective on the SSM, not only because you're from the outside and you have a vast experience, but you were one of the reviewers mm -hmm. of the 40 reviews we had in four <laughs> years. Um, four zero, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but I value your experience and your opinion and your p position very much. So I think you can give us an insight and in what do you think we need to do in, uh, with regard to supervision, you know, um, the next f uh, five years. And I'm looking into the macroeconomic environment, yeah, there, there are some questions coming up. Um, um, and, 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 you know, the regulatory environment, the tools are very important, but there's another um, um, side um, in, in this work too. So please. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, Give us the long list what to do, you know. <laughs> Before I begin, the other panel violated their mandate and went into the future a bit. So I want to violate the mandate of this if I can and just say how uh, what an exceptional job Danielle has done uh, in, in setting up the SSM. And you're right, it is you, but it is... Sabine, it is the Stuff. senior EGs. management uh, it's the staff, as, as Sabine said, I undertook a review and talked to some folks who had been setting up the SSM, and they had no idea this was going to be a 24-7 job for, for several years. Also, the NCAs. Uh, I think the leadership of the NCAs in supporting this centralized focus in Frankfurt also deserves some credit. So, I think it's, and I think also, and I sent both uh, Danielle and Sabine a note when they joined saying it was great to have people with a lot of institutional knowledge staying in public service, giving up the huge salaries that everyone was being offered to go work in the industry. So uh, you have my res respect. Uh, I've got three things that I'd like to quickly throw out and it's tough with so many smart people and going at the end of, of two panels, but something that I ha don't think has had quite as much mention as, as I would give it, is NPLs and continuing to work down the legacy NPLs. I think as an outsider, when you talk to folks about the European banks, that's something that's always raised. And while I think the SSM has made a lot of progress in reducing the level of NPLs, they're still very high for developed countries uh, with economies going. And boy, do we live in an uncertain world. And we've talked about complacency. I think that crises tend to be cyclical. There will be another one. And if there was ever a time for banks to build their capital and shed those assets that are non-performing, and that gets to, uh, I guess, Klaus's point about the the weak earnings. You don't make a lot of money on NPLs, so getting income up in part is getting rid of those NPLs or, or getting them down. The second piece, which has also been mentioned, is the consolidation of the industry. 
And I don't think supervisors should pick winners and losers to pick who should do what. But when you have a system in Europe where so many banks are not earning their capital, I think it is incumbent upon the SSM to put pressure on the management and the boards of those banks that if they're not viable, and if you don't want to end up being resolved, you, you go for a voluntary merger, you go for some type of acquisition, and you do that looking European-wide. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, the U.S. experience. We used to have statewide banking effectively. We had a lot of banks in Texas, which were doing very well until we had an energy crisis. When there was a crisis, there were no local banks, in-state banks, that could be acquirers. Everybody was weak, and you had to turn outside, to turn to North Carolina to bring banks in. Similarly in Europe, if in a country you have, and Europe is so big that you're going to have some areas of the world doing very well and others doing poorly, in those regions that are doing poorly, you have to be able to look to banks outside of that region to come in. They have the capital. They're in a position where they can do an acquisition. Uh, being limited to, to national banks, so to speak, and, and it was said earlier, Europe's got to get to the point where you have European banks and it's not cross-border if a Dutch and a German bank merge. My third recommendation is ultimately, I think, the SSM needs to be a centralized supervisor. Um, I think that there has been a lot of progress. I think Danielle or, or Mr. Draghi mentioned 2,000 supervisors in the NCAs and 1,000 in Frankfurt. But uh, I think over time, when Andrea takes over, there has to be a centralized management of all of the resources for both SIs and LSIs. When a small member country gets into difficulty, you can't, and it's LSIs, uh, you can't rely on the local supervisors to take it. Having, again, spent a lot of time in the US, we, we often moved a lot of supervisors from one part of, the, from the Northeast to deal with the energy problems in the West or the Midwest when there were ag problems. Those of you remaining in the SSM have to view the entire, I guess it's 5,000 staff as a resource that can be devoted to dealing with problems. That means comparable comp and benefits. You can't have, we talked about two classes of banks, the, the small and the SIs, similar to the supervisors. The supervisors have to be a team. They have to have the similar type of, of benefits so that there's, you know, it's enough. But I would, I would move towards much more of a centralized approach. You see, that's why we need an outside view because somebody from inside would never be able to say this. <laughs> yeah. To think it, but to say it is something else. Um, that was a different institutional setup, <laughs> you know, uh, question, and not so much, you know, linked to the uh, treaty. Yeah. Um, I mean, looking looking into the consolidation, I would like to pick up, you know, um, uh, the second part of, of Jonathan's um, um, answer. Uh, what do you think could the lawmaker do in order to um, to help and to promote a consolidation? Well, I and by the way, I mean, you want us to take over tasks which are not really totally ours. Perhaps the lawmaker can help there too um, to, you know? I was <laughs> trying, of course, uh, I was, uh, with my first yeah. answer, showing our weakness uh, and uh, playing the ball back to you. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, true. Um, so if we look at the inability since six years to come forward with the Eurozone reform. And we are seeing the signs of backlash in, uh, in regulatory issues with the absence of a crisis, as uh, Jonathan is saying. 
In these moments, institutions are stronger than policymakers. So institutions have a clear mandate. The ECB has a clear mandate for the stability of the currency. The uh, SSM has a, a far-reaching mandate when it comes to prudence and solvency. And uh, you can interpret this uh, uh, narrowly or widely. I, uh, and I was not saying overstepping the mandate taking the mandate seriously and, sh and seeing in the real world what, um, what touches and endangers uh, solvency. And if you look at what endangers solvency, you can go very far. Uh, and uh, I can be now a bit more provocative. We, can, uh, we cannot close, for instance, the, bi the problem of the sovereign risk. I've seen it several times in Trilog. It's the one who's not to be named, uh, uh, solvency risk uh, of sovereigns. So uh, it, is, uh, it is unsolvable politically at the moment. But you have pillar two, so, uh, and, uh, which is a very wide mandate. Uh, look at all the additional risks uh, which are not covered elsewhere, I put it uh, literally. Uh, you have tackled uh, uh, with the, uh, the NPL issue, which was politically not uh, solvable. I see some people being nervous. Uh, I, would, uh, I, would, uh, I would recommend uh, uh, the same with financial crime. Uh, it was uh, evident that national supervision of financial crime was not working. Uh, and then you got it on the level of LSIs, uh, banking failures, and even with SSM institutions in in Latvia, and, uh, and there are more institutions which are severely weakened because they uh, um, uh, did too much uh, financial crime. So therefore, it is a problem which is covered by your mandate. And, uh, and I can only say, with the responsibility for the, uh, for the stability of, uh, of your institutions, you should take that uh, fully seriously. And, and there's something which uh, the ECB can do without any law change in law. And I know Enria, um, Andrea in his former function was insisting a lot on transparency. When is uh, the SSM making public the Pillar 2 requirements and uh, the results of its own stress testing on an institution by institution basis? I think uh, this is something you could do in order to ensure a level playing field and it would give uh, more teeth. In pillar two we have the difference between requirements and guidance. If this would be fully transparent, uh, it would make uh, the whole system, uh, would give it more teeth. Perhaps it cannot be done from what, today or from tomorrow, but you can say in two years it will be public and then institutions can prepare. So uh, I think there is a, still a lot of space in the laws we have already agreed. And in the absence of a severe crisis, it is not the moment when um, lawmakers will be the most likely to achieve, but institutions. And uh, you are a strong institution. You have a strong mandate. And uh, Danielle has shown how much uh, you can do. And I only wanted to I, uh, announce it to you. There will be a small surprise. I wanted to give the two of you uh, a balloon journey when you are um, to have a, look, a far look on the, <laughs> over the skyscrapers. And the two of you together, because it is great, it is true, Danielle achieved uh, immensely. And I can only praise her for that. But you also achieved it together. And it was always one of my deep satisfactions that we have put two women above all the banks. I loved that. Uh, and uh, I loved that. And, uh, and I, uh, I, I'm still happy about it until today. And I would even love more this picture, having two women on a balloon <laughs> looking over the city of Frankfurt. And I will give that to you, but I studied the compliance rules. <laughs> so if I would have given it to you today, they probably would have taken it away. Yeah? So therefore, I will wait until you, uh, the two of you, and I hope it will take a long time, two of you are out of office and then you get it, and the legal uh, department can now study whether this is a breach of compliance rules or not. <laughs> but I will give it to you anyway. So uh, that is, uh, 
uh, and, and I think you really deserve that balloon flight to look over all the banks without having to meet one of the bankers yourself <laughs> and none of the ESSM staff yourself at that moment. Yeah? Many thanks already up front, Sven. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I mean, you see, we, we, we need to be bold and brave again, yeah, if I, if I understood this correctly, and I could mm -hmm. at least answer, I would I hope you don't have any fear. Not at all. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm very stable and <laughs> yeah, even in a balloon. <laughs> um, no, um, I, I, I think we, we, we very clearly see that, um, that all here on, on the stage, yeah, um, uh, see necessity to move forward, yeah, that the work is not yet finished, yeah. Uh, you want us to move forward, uh, bold and, and brave, and to use all the space we have, yeah. But going now into the details, yeah, you didn't answer the second part of my question with the consolidation. Do you? Shall you I know? tell you what I think about this? Yeah, uh, please. Uh, of so. course, it is uh, uh, first, um, if banks don't earn. Um, return on capital, of course, that is a supervisory issue. On the other hand, there is not such a thing as um, a high profitability on capital. So we have to be careful to accept. Uh, there is, uh, there is um, in a market economy, uh, no need to have super high returns. We speak about a sufficient uh, return. We don't speak about super high returns. Uh, and there were expectations in the banking sector in the past which cannot be the yardstick for supervision. Uh, also, there are banks which do not have as an objective to, uh, to earn much more than they need. So uh, there is in a social market economy also cooperatives. There are mission-based uh, uh, institutions like uh, also the Sparkassen in Germany and public banks, which have not as an objective to have uh, super high um, uh, returns. And we should uh, not act when we take that seriously, not act uh, uh, and say there's only a uniform model of banking and that is a well. stock market listed bank. And only if you are having so high returns that you are not a potential victim of um, of a takeover, only then you are sound. This cannot be the no, yardstick. But I think the yardstick we are not talking about no, no, that no. one. Yeah? Well, I, mean, um, I have heard uh, very strange remarks in the past in this regard, and that's why I say it. I, don't, I haven't invented it, because, and uh, this is uh, very important. But if banks are not able to earn enough to continue soundly, then of course. That's what I meant. Then of course, I, I can only agree what, what you are saying. So then, of course, supervisors uh, should exert uh, uh, pressure. And uh, of course, as Europeans, we have an interest to have more cross-border institutions. So uh, I would also agree with this statement. Uh, and that is uh, uh, something where, where I have not a problem. And I think there was a very important remark made on the former panel, uh, not to confuse uh, uh, proportionality mm. with low standards. Proportionality for me means that um, smaller and conservative institutions should not be overburdened uh, with the supervisory work, but this, this level of soundness should be the same. And that should not be confused. But in order to gain the political space, <laughs> to, ins uh, to insist also on the soundness of the LSIs, uh, it is important not to confuse the two things. If there's any suspicion that this is confused, the political space will disappear. Uh, and therefore, I think, uh, and, and we have seen uh, such signals in the past. So uh, I think one has to live, the one has to accept the plurality of the system, but should, of course, insist that there is an equal and same level of um, uh, of soundness also in the LSIs. And, uh, and in the LSIs, I think there was a certain laxism in some areas. So I'm looking forward whether the NPL rules, uh, which came with the addendum, 
will also be applied fully uh, to, to all the LSIs. So that is, uh, seems to me important and that should be done. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. But I saw Eke being nervous. He, she wanted to take the floor. Hmm? I would just like to build a bit on what uh, Sven has said. Of course, there is not an absolute yardstick in return on equity and shouldn't be. But you need to earn sufficient to make your capital adequate to your business model. Otherwise, you're not sound. And I think that's where we need to really put a focus on. And to go one step further, and we should not confuse ourselves in saying, and if you're not sound, then merger solves the problem. If you're not sound in a market economy, then the most logical answer is you exit the market. And our task has to be to ensure that also for a bank that is a bit a specific animal compared to the shop next door, you have a sound policy and you have a sound system for exit. That merger is always a solution if it is a merger of an interesting, viable core business of a bank that you merge with another bank and the like, fine. But for merger, you need a business model. And Danielle has heard me that she would now be surprised if I wouldn't say it. Two awful, ugly ducks don't make a brilliant swan. <coughs> so be aware that when you talk about mergers, you should not create the problem for in two years' time. So I think we need to work by far more forceful, all of us, on making the sound basis for insolvency systems being fit for purpose for banks being resolvable, and then use merger as one of the possible tools for some of the opportunities. And I think this is the way forward. This is how I see the FDIC partially works. And I would just like to add, because Sven also went to talk about LSIs, let's be realistic when you look at the last decades of failures we need to have an answer not just for GSIPs. We definitely need an answer for GSIPs, but we need an answer for the middle layer and for the smaller banks because they all compete in the same market. Can I push yeah, back but, a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. let us go to Jonathan first and then, yeah. well, both Jonathan. I'm very sorry to Sir Jonathan. Sir Jonathan. Sir That's Jonathan. The other, that the is. other Jonathan. <laughs> Forget about the title except to distinguish between them. Yeah. Uh, he's a Republican. Uh, he's a strong Republic, I meant. Uh, I'm not. Um, two points. In the, uh, and I'm looking back to look forward, in the uh, period of negotiation of uh, the SSM regulation, the fundamental goals of what we were trying to do because of the crisis and because a lot of hard thinking were not the most difficult. We had two big legal problems. One was the treaty. How far can we go? And I agree with Sven, with a different treaty, we could have gone further, we could go further today. It's unlikely to happen in our five-year period. So we are in the legal framework that we are in. The second point is, and this is ironical, I suppose, now, we spent an enormous amount of time negotiating with the countries outside the euro area to create a docking mechanism so that one day, if they wanted to join the banking union, they could do so, both in the SSM and in the SRM. Of course, the leading non-euro country was the United Kingdom, and they spent, we spent with them hours arguing about these things, knowing that it was largely uh, fictitious, and what we were really thinking about was, I'll mention names, Denmark, Sweden, uh, others, perhaps one day. In five years' time, I, I'm not here to speculate, it may well be that the banking union has more members, it may well be that the euro area has more members. Uh, the effect of Brussels without, I use Brussels generically, Brussels without the UK could be in the next five years to focus attention on the Eurozone much more 
uh, seriously, radically, than has been the case hitherto. Second point, anecdotal but not without interest, it so happens that many of the people in uh, the Commission's Financial Services Department had a background in competition policy. I did, my successor Olivier Gerson does, Nadia Calvino, now a distinguished minister of the Kingdom of Spain, did, and so on. So the relationship between the centre and the national authorities was thought about very much in the light of what the European merger regulation had done, which was to split jurisdiction and in the hope, and I think realised uh, over the years in merger policy and realised very quickly here too, much more quickly, miraculously quickly, thanks to Danielle uh, and, and her colleagues, is that the intellectual leadership from the centre, in addition to all the legal rules, creates a framework in which cooperation is the order of the day. There are frictions, no doubt, from time to time, but generally speaking, that relationship in the regulatory operations of the European Union between central, what the Americans would call federal institutions and member state institutions can work very well. I would as, add, as an old commission hand, as long as the commission has the requisite legal powers and the, uh, uh, the quality of people to uh, assert intellectual leadership. Secondly, and this is an old competition person speaking, in the question about consolidation of the uh, uh, Eurozone, uh, or indeed the EU uh, banking sector, I would simply say, uh, when there is a relevant market in the sense of a common regulatory space in which competition is really taking place across either the euro area or <coughs> the EU as a whole, uh, that should be the framework in which uh, mergers between two banks should be assessed. If that is not yet the case, then I'm afraid still that every country will have to be looked at still as a separate uh, jurisdiction, but it will depend on the facts not quite a science, but it's not far off, where is competition really taking place for a certain number of categories of, of users, of consumers of banking services? Is it in individual countries still, or is it now uh, in a wider group of countries? Well, and I would add with regard to national ring fencing, yeah, um, there's another question uh, coming up, you know, uh, where is the single jurisdiction? Yeah. Jonathan. I'd like to clarify one point mm -hmm. and then uh, add one thing to the to-do list for the SSM. The clarification is where I was promoting mergers and talking about Texas with the failing banks and bringing out side banks in, uh, it was really different than in my pushing the consolidation. The, the, uh, from my perspective, it's really targeting the 20% the of the European banking system that is weak, that's really having difficulty earning its capital. And what I was trying to promote was not a Japanese convoy system where you, a bank gets into trouble and Sabine, it's your turn to pick it up, but rather the SSM creating a regulatory environment where these weak banks voluntarily went out and looked for someone where they could uh, gather the economies of scale. I mean, one of the difficulties that was mentioned on the earlier panel was the lending limits. And in some countries where you have very small banks and bigger corporations, it's very tough not to have very large lending limits for a particular bank because they're the only bank around. And I think one of the advantages of, of much larger banks is that they're able to meet corporate needs better. The recommendation that I was going to make, and it was really the last couple of, of comments brought this up. Supervision's not sexy. Oh, don't say this. I think it's the most <coughs> sexiest thing. <laughs> so we have it's an never area boring, yeah. that's not <laughs> sexy, and we have the risk of complacency. Uh -huh. And something that, that I think is, is critical, and I, I think Danielle did a lot of this, but the NCAs, Brussels, need to regularly during these good times, be 
much stronger advocacy positions on things like the consolidation. I mean, I, I take it that it's, it's really the NCAs and the national governments that are resisting having European-wide banking. Germans want their own banks. And I think it's a question of, in fact, all the things we've talked about, NPLs, they're all in the best interests of the European citizens. But parliamentarians, we, I did some work when I was at the fund with the Competition Commission, and, and I would agree, they were not supervisors. They did not understand what the ultimate objectives were. And so I think a lot more outreach, advocacy, both out of Frankfurt, but also the local NCAs convincing the powers that be of the benefit of having a strong system. Having European banks that are too weak to support the local economy is in no one's interest. Yeah, but I mean, you just said um, we should have a regulatory environment um, as a supervisor, mm -hmm. created, creating a regulatory environment which uh, promotes, you know, a voluntarily um, a movement of the banks. Yes. What do you mean in well, concrete to the, make up our I, shopping list? You the know way what I, I mean? have <laughs> seen it is, and it was mentioned pillar two, you begin to jack up the capital requirements. And if you have a bank that cannot today even earn enough to pay for its current capital, you, you then begin looking around for, as, as Elke said, exit strategies. Uh, I mean, we're in good times right now, notwithstanding the 800 drop in the Dell Jones yesterday. These are pretty good times. This is the time to be strengthening the banking system, waiting for that, that, next, that next hiccup. And it's, it's going to come based on the past. It will come from some surprising corner that we have no idea yeah. where it's going to be. I mean, you have, you have some little signals, but, but capital is the, the easiest that, and I would also, I would set much more aggressive NPL targets. I would move LSIs into the ECB if they don't meet that target. Um. Mm -hmm. You see? <laughs> so again, we should be more bold and brave and, and raise capital um, uh, standards. Let's see how the European lawmakers deals with us with regard to um, uh, total capital, um, pillar two, um, not being only CET1, but um, eight, um, um, 81, et cetera, um, which is not really um, a big support, um, um, uh, uh, to, to say it uh, bluntly. Um, um, <laughs> Well, well, you know, uh, uh, you, that's you are. An old yeah. story. <laughs> Sabine, only to, to play yeah. that ball uh, back. Uh, uh, the interpretation of the 80, 81 rule uh, and, uh, and the MDA trigger point was first diverted from the practice to the law, and then the law uh, was now adapted to the practice you developed, only to play that back. Uh, and everybody who knows the subject uh, knows exactly what I'm talking about. And of course, in the- I'm talking about in the, something else. Yeah, and my but memory that is, is different too, mm -hmm. I have to admit. I, um, I may, uh, we, but then we disagree here really, because, yeah, yeah. Uh, because so. the current law yeah. uh, says very clearly, if pillar two, and there was in the law, there's no difference between guidance and requirement, is violated, then uh, the MDA trigger point should be triggered. This uh, has led to an sa additional safety margin for all banks from, this, uh, from the Pillar 2 requirement. By distinguishing between guidance and um, requirement, uh, which was not in the law but developed by the practice uh, of supervision, there was a de facto lowering of the capital requirement. So, uh, and that is not a conspiracy theory, but uh, uh, this is, uh, I think, what has happened. And now, with the CRD, CRR package, this, pr which was developed uh, uh, in supervisory practice, has now, been, um, has now been put into the reformed uh, banking package. Uh, <coughs> one can have a long debate whether the effect of the MDA trigger point uh, 
on the whole Pillar 2 requirement was wanted. And one can discuss this, but de facto, there was a lowering of the effective uh, capital requirements. So uh, therefore, that is a very sensitive issue because it is a huge amount of capital we speak about. Yeah, yeah, but let me, let me really uh, try to um, give a different picture here, yeah? I mm -hmm. mean, I, I, I do understand quite well that we had a discussion in the supervisory board and here as a practice to have a very clear pillar two requirement rule only mm -hmm. and then we got RTS and, and, and uh, practice, well, it's not practice, yeah? It's, it's quasi rulemaking from the other side. What I was, so it was not that way around, yeah? Uh, to be very clear, I um, uh, Sven, there I do not agree with you. I fully disagree, yeah? Uh, I remember correctly, don't I? Yeah, I mean, it's already three years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we were tough, yeah? And hence mm -hmm. we got um, a pushback. And um, where did yeah? it start? Uh, but again, I mean, my question was a different not one. Here. Not, not here. Not here. I agree. Oh, I know. Yeah. I know. But exactly. not you. Exactly. Uh, Daniel, <laughs> Daniel. Daniel, if I, Daniel, Daniel, if I say practice, there are more supervisors than the ECB. Ah. And you know exactly how it went. I didn't uh, say ECB, okay. I said the practice. And you know that there were two other uh, supervisors which diverted from the law, which were not in line with your policy, and the commission which have, should have ensured that the law is ensured everywhere didn't act. So I was I not put it playing that ball into your nice corner, Danielle. That is uh, good that it is out that very now. Clear, very to clearly. Say, to be very Sven, clear. I yeah. was I was rather alluding mm -hmm. to you know the, the the question of whether pillar two um, requirements uh, should be only covered by CET one, or mm -hmm. um, by additional um, uh, capital instruments too. Mm -hmm. and, and here I have to admit, uh, coming from the tougher side, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would have loved to stay with CET1 mm -hmm. and not to give an incentive to mm -hmm. financial innovation, mm -hmm. um, which we have seen before the crisis. Mm -hmm. yeah, and perhaps that we can agree upon yeah, because yeah, it yeah. Is, um, it, 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 this is not a good development. 